Hi there. My name is Gabe Ferrer. I'm a parishioner here at St. Joseph Catholic Church in Conway, Arkansas, and I'm presenting a series of uh, short videos about the Eucharist uh, in the Bible. And we're going to explore in these videos what the church teaches about the Eucharist based on what God reveals to us about the Eucharist in the Bible. Now, in thinking about the Eucharist, the Eucharist is, is, is a bigger subject than the Eucharist itself. It has a bigger and larger context that we're going to be exploring over the course of these videos. And a central part of that context is that our life in this world is a difficult one. It's a life of suffering and struggle, a life in which good does battle against evil, both in the external world and more importantly, within our own hearts and our own struggle against sin. So where does this all begin? So to think about this, we're going to look at a reading from the book of Revelation, Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. So what we see here is that really before creation even happened, there was a great battle in heaven and the devil was thrown down to earth. He was ejected from heaven because of his rebellion against God. And ultimately, he's going to be defeated by Christ and become subordinate to Christ. But how that happens is not altogether clear before this journey that we're going to undertake that will uh, involve a deeper understanding of the Eucharist. But before we get to that point, we need to think for a moment about when the devil was cast down to earth, just what was he up to? Now the church teaches that the devil was jealous of humanity and sought then to encourage in humanity the same rebellion that he himself undertook against God in heaven. So to that end, let's read from the book of Genesis. We'll look at chapter three. Verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So there's a lot of interesting detail in this passage. The church traditionally understands the serpent to be the devil disguised as a snake in order to tempt our first parents. And to think about the nature of this temptation, we have to think about what it means to have knowledge of good and evil. For the author of Genesis, knowledge was not merely facts in your head. Knowledge also included experience. So the taking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was their desire to experience evil. Now, evil is often very appealing, and we see that here in this passage. 
The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. Common excuse, one might say, for sin. And so they take upon themselves the knowledge, the experience of evil, and in doing so become aware that they are naked. So what does that mean? Obviously, they were naked beforehand and not ashamed, as the writer of Genesis puts it. But now they find the need to sow fig leaves for themselves. Why? Because in committing this original sin, they threw away a primordial gift of grace that God had given them. And that primordial gift of grace involved fully subordinating the body to the will. Their nakedness is now a reminder that having lost that grace, their bodies are no longer subordinated to their wills. And so they cover them up as a sign of humility, knowing that their bodies are no longer subordinate to their wills. So things kind of get worse at this point, and God makes clear to them the consequences of the choice to do evil. Their world is now a place of suffering, as we see in Genesis 3, 16 to 19. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is a hard saying, but it's a direct consequence of the sin of our first parents, is that the world became a place of suffering, not as God had originally intended. But so it went. But it's actually even worse than this, because in addition to the loss of paradise on earth, there's furthermore the loss of eternal life, as we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Having sinned and the world having become a place of suffering, God in his mercy decrees that our life on earth should be bounded and finite. Why? Because in our state of sin, being eternal in a state of sin is an even greater suffering than suffering the loss of life on earth. But God really meant more for us than this, and he never ceased to reach out to us, even in the midst of our sins. And we see this throughout the Bible. I want to select one specific passage that gets at this idea. This is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 5 through 10. This is a great prophecy of what the Lord really desires for us. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not pass over it, and fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. 
they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So there's a lot of important details in this vision that we see from Isaiah. God here promises through Isaiah a vision of living in a world where earthly sufferings have gone away. He furthermore states it's not completely unconditional. The unclean shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. In other words... God prophesies a path for redemption, wherein the ransomed of the Lord shall return. So God intends to ransom his people who have fallen into sin so that they may be redeemed. And at that point, the Zion he speaks of is not an earthly place. Why? Because everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. He is, in effect, promising here a restoration of that which was lost by the sin of our first parents. And how is this to be accomplished? Well, this starts bringing us into the New Testament. So we're going to start at uh, the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at chapter 4, uh, verses 18 and 19, where in Luke's account, Jesus begins his earthly ministry. So Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. So, Jesus opened the book of the prophet Isaiah and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim an acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So at this moment, Jesus uh, fulfills or announces the fulfillment of Isaiah 35, that he is the one who has come to bring about what Isaiah is promised. Now, the people of the Lord are to be ransomed, in the words of Isaiah. And that, too, is a vocabulary that Jesus uses to describe his salvific work. Let's turn now to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to look at chapter 10, verse 45. So, chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says, for the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here Jesus describes how he's going to effect his work of redemption and bring about the fulfillment of what Isaiah promised. He is going to give his life as a ransom for us. So to summarize uh, the main points of this video. Humanity is separated from God and is in bondage to the devil. However, God plans our redemption from the moment of that separation. Jesus gives his life as a ransom for us. And having been ransomed, we may now hope for eternal life. So in the next video, we're going to explore this in more detail. What's the nature of the sacrifice Jesus makes for our ransom? And how do we participate in it? And more importantly, how does our participation in the Eucharist form an essential part of our participation in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ? See you in the next chapter.